Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I would like to thank the reform members of this channel. Interscare wifey, Denise S., Through Scrutiny, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you would like to learn how to become a member of this channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you and check out my GoFundMe, all of that can be found down below. If you are new here or haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also alerts you every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Trucker and Road Trip Stories. Right after this intro an ad will play, I'll read the first story an ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer: This video will contain foul language and material and content not suitable for all listeners. If you are sensitive to these topics, this is not the video for you. Everyone else, let's get started, shall we? I'm not a truck driver, but I heard a crazy story from a buddy of mine when we were really young. There is one large truck stop in the city that we live in and we were getting our driver's licenses and had to do an on-road training with a driving instructor. The city is small enough that the instructors know a lot of the police in town and as my buddy drove past the truck stop, they noticed a ton of police cars and EMS vehicles. They stopped to say hello to the police, and one of them informed the driver's ed instructor that a trucker got drunk and asked if they could show the kids what happens to people who drink around heavy machinery. He told me that a driver got royally messed up on booze and passed out behind a semi, and as the truck backed up in the morning, he squashed the driver's head like a watermelon and had no clue about the entire ordeal until he was far enough out of his spot to see what he had done. Talk about crazy. Not a long haul driver, but had a few run ins. Last summer, I had went into a gas station with a coworker to fill up on gas. When I was on my way to walk inside, this woman with a long red and matted hair kept staring me down. I said, evening ma'am, and went inside. As I got inside, I turned and looked and she was still staring. So I went about my business, grabbed a drink and was fixing up a hot dog when I seen she was still staring. I turned to my coworker and told him she was being a creeper. My coworker just replied with, she was just admiring my young beauty, as smartass as one could be, until a few minutes later, he too noticed she was acting weird towards me. As we went to leave, I mentioned to the clerk that they had a doozy on their hands, see lot lizards there all the time, and mentioned, yeah, she has ran some people off and has been there for three days prior to this one. Anyways. As I went to turn around and leave, she was pressed up against the doors, holding them shut and staring at me. I motioned with my hand for her to move and she took a step back. I blew through the left exit door and sprinted back to the truck. Anyways, the next night I hadn't seen her before work and thought she had left but that night I had to get a pack of smokes and some gas. I entered and exited and never saw her until I was about to leave. As I was putting the fuel pump away, I could feel somebody had come up behind me. And sure as shit, it was her. I just slowly turned as I opened the door and she tried to force her way into my truck. Luckily, another co-worker was at the pump next to mine and forced her off of me and a police officer was there to help assist and put her in his squad car. Ever since, I tend to stay away from that place. I'm a big guy, but Jesus Christ, I couldn't move an inch due to the sheer fear, and I even concealed carry 
and couldn't move a single inch. My stepfather is a truck driver. Anyone who's familiar with the 401 highway in Ontario knows how shit it can be in winter. He was heading to Ottawa after a pickup in Toronto, and just before Kingston, another truck had jackknifed about 10 minutes past Kingston. When the truck jackknifed, it slid into the barrier and rolled. The traffic was moving, but pretty heavy. The cars behind the truck didn't have time to stop, and 14 or 15 cars and vans and pickups ran into the initial crash at speed. My stepfather was a few vehicles back, saw the initial crash, and hit his air brakes for all he was worth. Luckily, he had the length to get it stopped, and his load was heavy, but not enough to force the truck to keep rolling. About 10 to 15 minutes go by. First responders are on scene, inspecting the crash and working out how to start getting at the victims still trapped. My stepfather has always stressed one specific detail about vehicle safety in the event of a situation like this. Stay the fuck in your car unless there is immediate danger in there with you, or you can see someone in urgent need. Wait for the first responders to come to you unless you're uninjured and have a clear path the fuck away from the road. So, he's idling his truck about 10 meters back from the crash itself. He sees a woman, whose car is about midway in the pileup, slowly open her door and kind of stagger out of her mangled car. She looks disoriented and is clearly moving like she's confused and doesn't know what happened. He has an oh fuck moment and opens the door about to run out and get her. She's staggering towards the median, not the shoulder, and he's worried she's going to wander into oncoming traffic on the other side of the highway. As he's stepping out onto the running boards, he hears an air horn pulled repeatedly. He jumps back in, pulling his door closed behind him as another transport comes straight on into the wreck. The guy hit more black ice and the weight of his load and momentum carried the truck forward into the median. The woman had made it to a point where she was between the truck and the median. My stepfather watched a woman, who he'd been about to run out and pull from the road, get cut completely in half. In my first year of driving a semi, I was pretty naive to what happens in truck stops and rest areas, to say the least. Not knowing the world around me can have some pretty awful places. That being said, I took a load out of New York City, heading to Savannah. With the hours I had left, I planned to stop for my break in Jessup, Maryland, at a TA. Arrived while the sun was still up at around 6.30 p.m. Didn't think much of my surroundings, so I went inside to eat. After eating, I went back outside to see literally about 60 women just wandering around everywhere. If I had to guess, the age range was between 18 and 75. I was propositioned at least 15 times on my way back to my truck and it didn't stop there. All through the night, I had all kinds of lot lizards knocking on my truck door. Worst place ever to take a break. I never stopped there any longer. These women all look like they chose meth as a career in life. Jessup, Maryland, TA is a place of sadness and despair. My dad was a lorry driver, UK here, for a good long while, and he has some awesome stories. If this thread is still going when I get home, I'll get him to tell some, but for now, here's a story he has about another driver. This guy was a trucker down in Australia, 
driving those huge land trains across the long, long outback roads. These are seriously lengthy journeys. And back then, every driver who wanted to make the delivery on time went past their max hours. As you might imagine, you get very tired. It was common to hear drivers talk of hallucinations. So, this guy is in the middle of his trip, driving along the dark, empty road, when he sees something big move onto the road. An elephant. Big, gray beast, giant ears, and a trunk. In the middle of the Australian outback. Right where he's heading at speed. Of course, he's feeling pretty awake now and swerves out to avoid hitting this thing, manages to miss it, but loses control of the vehicle and comes off the road. Mr. Trucker gets out, unscathed, and looks back. Nothing on the road. Well, crikey might, he thinks to himself. Bloody hallucinations. He checks his vehicle to make sure it's all okay, losing lots of time before getting back in and getting to his destination slightly late. Unloads his stuff, loads up with another delivery, and starts heading back the way he came. So, here's Mr. Trucker driving down the road again, still tired, making his way through the outback, when what does he see? But, elephant enters stage left. Oh, fuck, not again, he thinks. Screw this, I'm not losing more time. So he shuffles in his seat, keeps his foot on the gas, and plows straight into a five-ton elephant. Kills the elephant, totals the truck, does not make it home in time for neighbors. Turned out that the elephant had escaped from a circus that was traveling around the time. Since then, my dad made sure that no matter how ridiculous something seemed, he swerved. My grandfather was a state trooper and a detective accident detective. I have two interesting truck stories from him. Number one, he told of a group of college kids driving somewhere for spring break and being distracted one way or another. They hit a semi. He said when he showed up, three of them were out of the car and one was still sitting in the back behind the passenger. The roof of the car had been pretty well peeled back, with most of the damage being on the passenger side of the car. The passenger's shoulder was fucked up from the crash, and everyone was sobbing. So no one was really being cooperative when my grandfather asked about the fourth individual. My grandfather walked up to the car to see if the fourth guy needed any help. He said from behind and on the left he looked fine. But when he got around to the front, the whole right side of the guy's head was destroyed. Story 2. When I was younger, I was helping my grandfather move this old police filing cabinet. And I was kind of digging through his old photos and files, and I stumbled across some guy, clearly dead, laying on the road. It was pretty gruesome. I inquired about the photo, and he said the trucker had fallen asleep and fallen out of his truck and ran himself over, cutting himself in half. It was the middle of the winter, so he froze to the ground. My grandfather said they had to pretty much scrape him off the road. Not a trucker, but I dated a girl who was. She was short haul, but occasionally had to run loads to a warehouse out of state. When she did, I usually tagged along. We pulled into this nasty abandoned looking truck stop right on the New Mexico-Texas border for fuel. All fueled up, we headed inside to see if we could get something to eat. The inside of this place looked like something out of fallout mostly empty shelves with random dust-covered canned goods and old boxes of this or that, lights flickering and making that pinging sound. Not a soul to be found. We grabbed a few bags of chips and waited near the register. 
After making some noise and waiting for like five minutes, we put the stuff back and went outside. Surrounding her truck were about ten guys who looked pretty fucking scary. Remembering I had left my gun in the truck, my stomach dropped. A biker then rolls up and talks to the two guys near the back of the truck for a minute, then does this slitting throat motion. My girlfriend is shaking and close to crying. I'm pretty sure I've already shit my pants. The biker throws his hands up, telling everyone to move, and walks over to us. He then, very politely, tells us that someone had stolen a trailer of his up north, and he was looking for it. This wasn't the one, so he apologized for the drama. He reaches into his pocket, grabs something, sticks it in my hand, and tells me he was sorry for the trouble. As he's walking away, I look at my hand, and it's a bag of weed. We got the fuck out of there pretty fast. Good fucking weed, though. We were joking about trying to find him on the way back and getting some more. I used to drive I-80 between San Francisco and Cheyenne, Wyoming a lot. It's about 16 to 20 hours of driving, depending on the weather and traffic and whatever else. Anyway, one time I got out at a rest stop to stretch my legs and take a piss, maybe buy a Coke. I go into the bathroom and there are three beefy bearded guys all naked from the waist down just lying on the ground blowing each other in a daisy chain. I looked at them, and two of them looked up at me, cocks in respective mouths, and one of them kept going, and the other one's eyes went wide as hell. I just said, uh, ugh, sorry, and walked right back outside. Oddly, all I could think of was, wow, that floor was probably filthy. A second time, I was driving at night, and the car starts making this odd grinding noise, like I ran over something that got stuck. It's about 2 a.m. I pull into a rest stop, well lit by the way, and wake up my buddy who was sleeping. I explain it to him. As we got out of the car, we both hear what sounds like a kid crying. There are no other cars at the rest stop, but we frequently heard stories about child trafficking and kidnapping nearby, so we decided to check it out. We grab our flashlights and head towards the noise, which is coming from the bathrooms. As we get closer, we realize it's coming from the women's bathroom, and it's a low, dull sobbing. We are prepared for the worst. We walk in expecting to see some brutally beaten and or sexually assaulted eight-year-old or something, and we see nothing. The sound is still there, and it's still clearly coming from the room, but the room is empty. We turn on the light. Still nothing. Check each stall, the trash can. Nothing. Even start looking for where in the room it was coming from. Nothing. Is it a hidden speaker? Are we on candid camera? What the fuck? My buddy climbs up one of the stalls to get to the top window at the rest stop, which is vented out and open. He closes it and the noise stops. Completely. Opens it and there's no more noise. We sit there for a few seconds, staring at each other. He shrugs. Then, the window slams shut again without him touching it. We are out of that fucking bathroom in seconds. The noise starts up within 10 seconds later as we got to the car, and we're tearing out of the parking lot within 10 more seconds. The grinding noise is still there, so this time I pull over a few miles later at a Flying J truck stop, well lit, sometimes occupied couple of truckers there, no other civilians like us. We check under the car. There's a red and silver piece of metal wedged between part of the car and the road, about half an inch or so off the ground. So, with us in the car, it would definitely have been grinding against the ground. Can't remove it by hand, it's really wedged in there, so we kick at it to bend it, and figured we'll remove it when we get back. 
A week later, I had my mechanic take it out when he was doing a service. It was part of a kid's tricycle. It was the red piece where somebody can stand on the back. I don't know why, and I don't think they were connected or anything, but that was one of those moments for me. Totally fucked up and crazy. Oh yeah, a quick edit to my story here. My buddy emailed me this. Hey man, I saw this on Reddit. Is this you? I was thinking about this the other day. I think it was coyotes. I heard some coyotes outside the cabin last month and they were like kids laughing or roughhousing. And later on, they were kind of crying and it sounded familiar. I don't know why it was coming from the bathroom. Maybe the drains in the floor were connected to where the coyotes were howling. Maybe the window or the wind or just the way the noise was carrying over the desert or bouncing off the walls. I don't know. But I think it was coyotes. It sounded just like it. When I was 17, I was living in one of those small towns without the community feel. It was a toxic place, rampant with drug addiction and crime. I learned from a young age to watch my own back and where not to go past dark or ever. This town held a lot of trauma for me. Some trauma is even scarier than this incident I'm about to share. I left this town a few short months after this incident and I would never think of moving back at this point in my life. For context, I was working a lot and finishing up my senior year, and we didn't have a working washer and dryer at home, so I had to go to the laundromat to do my laundry. I lived on the outside of town. It took five minutes to get into town, but we were so secluded. There were no street lights, and I lived on a street between two mountains. We were down the street from this abandoned dairy farm. We had acres to ourselves. We were really secluded. It was so dark out there, and there was only my street and the cross street to get to my street, so you knew when a car was on the road. One afternoon, I found some time to take my laundry to the laundromat, and I took my mom and brother's laundry with me so my mom wouldn't have to go during her work week. This meant I had three times the laundry to do, and it would take longer at the laundromat. But there was a Hastings next door, so I didn't worry too much as long as I was able to leave before dark, as it wasn't a very good area to be in. By the time I left, the sun was almost down, so it all worked out. By the time I was on the cross street to get to my street, it was completely dark, and I was all alone out there, I thought. I turned onto my street, and within seconds, there was someone behind me as close as they could get without hitting me, and they had their brights on. This confused me, as I had seen no other cars before I turned onto my street. It was like their lights were off until they were directly behind me. This gave me a pit in my stomach, so I sped up, and they kept up behind me. This was a windy, dark road, and my headlights were poor, so I was really starting to get anxious. I made a judgment call and drove right past my driveway. I didn't feel right possibly alerting some creek to where I live with my mom and baby brother, especially since cell reception was so poor out there. The person behind me was still as close as they could get to my bumper, and I kept speeding up. I knew that up ahead there was a fork in the road. Going straight would lead to the downtown area, and it's the way people go when they are heading that way. To go to the left, you entered a residential area with only a few homes, and a road that only really allowed one car at a time. At the last second, I turned onto this street, without turning my blinker on, in hopes that the car behind me would keep driving straight. They turned with me. By this point, I was very scared, but still hopeful that maybe the car behind me maybe lived in that area. We were going close to 50 miles per hour by now and just speeding up, as the car behind me really wasn't backing off, but staying as close as they could. 
They stayed so close that I couldn't even tell the make of their vehicle or whether they were driving a car or SUV or truck. I definitely couldn't tell who was in the vehicle. I couldn't understand why they wouldn't back off and I was afraid that if I slowed down, they would rear end me. All of a sudden, I see a home directly in front of me. The street was at a 90 degree angle and I had to turn left or crash into the home in front of me. Luckily, my car made the turn. I kept going and made a left to get onto the road that leads downtown. The car was still behind me. They didn't live in that neighborhood. At this point, I'm sure they're following me and I make the decision to drive to the sheriff's office. But I'm not sure how to get there. We're going around 60 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone and we start to pass a street that I recognize will lead to the sheriff's office. So I turn. But I turn so late that I might as well have made a U-turn. Finally, the car behind me can't make the turn and they keep driving. I drove around and made a lot of turns to ensure the car wouldn't end up directly behind me again. Finally, I pulled over my car and cried. I was safe this time, but I went home terrified and it changed the way I drive to this day. I moved to a more populated city and I live in a large apartment complex, but I still drive past my apartment when I get a weird feeling about someone behind me. Anytime someone pulls into the apartment behind me, I drive right past my apartment and circle the complex until I can park with no one behind me. My paranoia possibly saved me and my mom and baby brother from something that could have been so much worse. Pay attention to the people behind you. Waste the gas and drive past your home if you're scared. It may just save your life. I wasn't exactly an eyewitness to the actual event, but a buddy of mine was running a heavy haul load down a back road in Sacramento County. He was just starting out for the day, and as he approached a housing development, a woman pulled out about a mile or so ahead of him, turned towards him, and began to accelerate. And I mean hard. Just a few feet before she reached him, she ducked under the dashboard of the car. The only thing he could think at that time was, fuck, this is gonna hurt. She plowed into him head on. It turned out she decided to use him and his truck for a suicide. The truck was out of commission for some time. My buddy turned out to be okay. He refused to take any of this personally and counseling from the Sacramento County Sheriff's chaplain helped him quite a bit. The problem, though, was this woman was married to a real knuckle-dragger. He'd been beating her and mentally abusing her for years, and she finally had had enough. She left behind a family, and I still wonder about her kids, and how they're handling this years after the fact. Probably not well. Personally, I don't think I'd have handled things as well as my friend did. My hat's off to him. Back when I was a solo driver, I was making a delivery in Memphis, Tennessee. The receiver kept me there for so long that my clock ran out seven hours, and I had to go to West Memphis to the TA Petro to park for my 10-hour reset. When I got there, I had to park in the very back and very dark of the lot. I took my dog, Noodles, out to the restroom. While I was walking him, I saw a man at the back of a trailer just standing there. He made me nervous, so I hurried my pup and rushed him back to the truck. After that, I got out of the truck and started walking to the store so I could eat dinner. While I was walking, I heard footsteps behind me. When I turned to look, 
It looked like the same man I had seen behind the trailer, and he walked behind me the entire time. No matter how circuitous of a route I took, he followed me. It freaked me out, but I wasn't really scared yet. When I got inside, I found that the store was packed and so was the restaurant. So I went and got a seat at the bar before it could be taken. I ordered my food and waited for it to come. Halfway through my dinner, my bladder reminded me I needed to use the bathroom. So I told the waitress I was not finished. I just had to go to the restroom and that I would be back. When I got back to my plate, my fork was on the right side of my plate. I looked around and didn't see the man that followed me inside, but was now scared. I'm left-handed and always put my utensils on the left side of my plate. Something was done to my food. I called the waitress over, still standing behind my chair, and asked if she messed with my food. She said no. I asked her if she saw anyone else mess with it, and she said she was too busy to have seen anyone. She went and got the manager. I told the manager about the man that had creepily followed me into the store, then disappeared when I entered. He got me a new mill and moved me to the seat closest to the office. He went into the office and came back out a few minutes later and sat down in the booth across from me. He said, I looked through the camera feed and a man did indeed come to where your food was setting while you were gone. He put something in your mashed potatoes, stirred it, and left back outside of the building. We don't have any cameras in the truck lot, so I don't know where he went. I don't want you to leave the store alone, and I also need to report this to the police. Do you mind if I call them? And I told him no, I didn't mind. So I sat there after I finished my meal and thanked him as he brought me a piece of pie on the house. It was freaking delicious. When the police came, they took a report and searched the grounds for the man, but didn't find him. After a few hours in total, the police officer told me he would drive me back to my truck, then told me that he was going to ask his boss if they could post a police officer out there all night to watch for the man. The boss man allowed it, and the entire night, there was a police officer parked in the deepest, darkest part of that lot, keeping watch. I appreciated it immensely. The man was never caught but nothing bad happened to me or anyone else that night. I'm thankful to those police officers still to this day, even though it's been a few years. Since I retired six months ago, I will tell you what I did rather than what I will do. With a single exception, the only times I encountered that was from a speeder expressing their anger at me for temporarily impeding their ability to break the law while I was passing a slower moving vehicle. Usually another truck goes slightly slower than me who inexplicably refused to back off for five seconds to allow me to pass in a timely manner. What I always did was to react with amusement, disgust, and relief. I would be amused by his revealing that he was not really in a hurry and disgusted by his self-righteous attitude, indicating that he feels I am denying him a constitutional right to break traffic law. I would always feel apologetic about slowing people down, but people who reacted as you described always relieved me of that unpleasant feeling. The only exception occurred in the wee hours of the morning, northbound on I-35 in Oklahoma, under a cryotank loaded with 42,000 pounds of liquid nitrogen to be delivered on site to a drilling company engaged in coil tubing operations to clear oil wells gunked up to the point of no longer being able to pump oil. Having become familiar with every rough spot on the stretch of blacktop between Oklahoma City and US-412, the right to need, whenever possible, I would change lanes to avoid a bump or extended rough stretch of highway. 
Operating a fast truck, that was more often than not as I felt justified in slowing down speeders, if I could maintain the speed limit. My attitude was why should I cause unnecessary wear and tear to my truck, resulting in more frequent repairs just to make it more convenient for others to break the law. If unable to go the speed limit, such as going up hill wall heavy, I would remain in my lane as I did not feel justified in forcing other traffic to go slower than the posted speed limit. Also, I would not cut people off at the last moment even if I could maintain the speed limit. But if there was a reasonable distance between us, I would move over, concluding that if speeding was so important to them, they could pass me by beating up their vehicle on the rough patch. I determined a reasonable distance as far enough to enable them to slow to the speed limit by letting off the gas without the need to brake. If they waited till the last moment and then hit the brake, it was their choice. Still with me? Okay. So there I was in the dead of what was a colder than average winter, northbound in Oklahoma around 1.30 in the morning. With very little traffic, I was avoiding all the rough spots, even able to go uphill while heavy. Approaching one such spot, there were headlights in my rear. Determining I could avoid the approaching bump and move back over before the trailing vehicle caught up, that is what I did. Even though he was a solid 1,000 feet behind me when I moved back to the right lane, for a reason I will never know. He became incensed by my driving. He came around, moved in front of me, and slowed to 10 miles per hour. I wasn't about to attempt to pass a wacko like that, preferring to keep him where I could keep an eye on him, until he calmed down and left me alone. 10 minutes went by, two other vehicles and a truck passed us, and still he crept along at 10 miles per hour. I was in no hurry was going to have time for a much-needed two-hour nap upon arrival at my destination before my delivery appointment. Another ten minutes went by before I placed a call to the cops, who frown on motorists fucking with truckers. Soon after I finished my phone call, two trucks approached us. I held them on the CB and explained my situation. They proceeded to put him in the rocking chair. The lead truck went on by. The second truck followed, moved over, and slowed to five miles per hour. I went around both, with the lead truck slowing. The second truck told me to move back over the moment my trailer cleared him, at which time he sped up while the lead truck simultaneously executed a rapid break, preventing the wacko who had moved behind me from being able to also move back over. When he fell in behind the truck in the right lane, which was now the faster of the two, he slowed, the other accelerated, and the asshole was trapped. The truck in the left lane began to ease across the zipper, forcing him onto the shoulder. They would have run him clear off the road, but luckily for the madman, we came upon an exit, which he took. Never saw him again, presumably because he had to change his soiled underpants. We concluded that it would be a long time before he decided to fuck with another trucker. I was driving through the hills of West Virginia along with several other trucks in regular midday traffic. I had just made the top of a particularly steep hill after a battle with keeping the truck moving faster than 25 miles per hour because of the grade and the weight of my load when an SUV screamed to pass me like I wasn't even there. There were three small kids in the back seat, not even buckled, and what I assume were the mother and father in the front. One little boy, maybe five years old, was in the very back window gesturing me to blow my air horn. Anyway, the incline suddenly becomes a very steep decline at this point in the road, and gravity immediately takes over, especially in fully loaded 18-wheelers. 
There is also an exit nearly a quarter of the way down that had a line of cars waiting for a light. The father in the SUV must have really wanted that exit badly because he jumped over into the lane ahead of the truck in front of me, but then had to lock his brakes when he saw the exit was already full. Of course, he left the truck behind him, nowhere to go, with a granite wall to his right and passing traffic on his left. I was barely able to swerve and force my way into the left lane myself as the truck, engine and air brakes fully engaged, slammed into the SUV. When I finally got my rig stopped and off the side of the road, I ran back up the hill to the accident. The driver of the truck was unhurt. I wouldn't call him okay, which is far more than I can say for the family in the SUV. Two of the kids, including the little boy in the window, were killed instantly, and the rest, including mom and dad, were in bad shape. I waited around and gave my statement to the highway patrol. Two months later, I had to go back to West Virginia and fill out an official affidavit. Despite what I had witnessed and reported, the driver was held at least partially culpable, which never would have happened if it had been two cars instead. That was well over a decade ago, and I still see that little boy's face trying to get me to blow my horn. Please, if you have kids, keep them buckled in the car. And please, for the love of all you hold sacred, dear and holy, give big trucks plenty of fucking space for braking. On flat, dry conditions, it takes a football field, approximately 100 yards, to safely stop a truck at 55 miles per hour. That distance only grows with weather, speed, and or hills. I only drive a truck for one year, but I had the scariest moment of my life during that time. I was going across Ohio on I-90 in the winter, carrying a load of beer out of New York and leading a small caravan of four to five other trucks. Was just going along minding my own business when a dump truck carrying what looked like a load of empty insulation bags in the dump box with no tarp covering it passed me by. I thought nothing of it and then seen a passenger car hot on his tail. Still. Thinking nothing might happen, I watched one of the empty insulation bags come out of the dump box and land on the road in front of the passenger vehicle. From there, stuff changed very quickly. The passenger vehicle, instead of just hitting the empty bag, instead slams on its brakes and starts to skid on the slightly wet and icy road. The driver loses control and does a 160 on the road and comes to a complete stop about 200 feet in front of me, windshield facing me. Knowing there was no way I could stop in time not to hit him, I decide to head for the ditch, thinking I would rather roll the truck rather than kill someone. I crank on the steering wheel, the driver's face getting bigger and bigger in my vision. I somehow manage to keep the truck on the shoulder of the road as I go past him, nothing indicating I had hit him. About a minute later, one of the other trucks behind me gets on the radio. Schneider, I don't know how you did it, but you couldn't have gotten a piece of paper between him and your trailer. Being so shaken, all I could do was respond in one word. Shit. The last thing I saw of that guy was his face through his windshield, eyes as big as dinner plates as I bore down on him. We both thought he was probably a dead man. It is a look that will haunt me for the rest of my life. I'm a trucker in Europe from Hungary. Crossing the channel from the continent to UK is very scary. There are a huge number of illegal immigrants who just wait to climb on trucks and get through to the promised land to Britain. 
from Brussels or from a French city, Lily, direction, Calais. It is suicide to stop for overnight. In 2002, I was a rookie. I ran out of my time and stopped for a night break near Brussels. Next morning, I checked in to take the Channel Tunnel train near Calais. The French police controlled me and they found eight persons in my trailer. In the British side, if they find hidden immigrants, they find you 2,000 pounds each. There were many accidents. Immigrants stabbed drivers to death. Immigrants died inside trailers because of loose cargo. There were suffocations when they climbed into tankers, which are loaded with cold fruit juice. They build barricades on the motorway, throwing objects at the trucks. The police are powerless. They are doing nothing. I had a nightmarish experience in 2004. It was before Christmas. I loaded some cargo in Romania. After loading, I had to wait long for custom papers. Romania joined to the EU later in 2007. I got my papers in the last minute. The next day, Christmas. Go. Budapest, 900 kilometers, no motorway, bad, narrow, mountainous roads, full of potholes. I didn't care about my legal time. I just pushed as fast as I could through the night. It means 16 to 18 hours driving under those circumstances, plus the border. I just wanted to be home on 24 to 26 of December. Then I had to continue my way to Spain. Around 2 in the early morning, I was doing 90 kilometers per hour. This is the max in Europe. A Romanian truck overtook me. It was an old Scania. It wasn't limited to 90 kilometers per hour electronically. I was very sleepy, just stared ahead. After a curve, I saw the Romanian truck stopped on the road. I watched the traffic from the opposite direction, if I can bypass the truck. As I approached, I saw a twisted shape, some object behind the Scania. I thought it might be the remains of an exploded tire. I saw the driver getting out from the cabin with a chalk white face. Suddenly I realized the truck hit a pedestrian. The disfigured something behind the truck was a human body. He was dead for sure. I saw half of a pair of the victim's shoe from 20 meters from the body. Meanwhile, a couple of cars stopped by the place, but apparently there was not much to be done. Needless to say, I wasn't sleepy anymore on the rest of my trip. This story takes place in Northeast Oklahoma, I believe around 2009 or 2010. I was around 14 years old at the time, so back then my aunt and I did everything together. She was my best friend, my rock, my everything really. Our favorite thing to do in our boring and rural town was to just go driving around. I believe I had just finished school for the summer. It was May and she offered to take me on a celebratory drive around town. In my hometown, there's an old mental hospital that has been closed since the 1990s, I think. It's located in more of a rural-ish area. I've always been fascinated by it, and she was too. She even worked there as a teenager. There's a prison located extremely close to it with guards and white trucks frequently driving the roads and preventing people from trying to sneak into the abandoned mental hospital. We both decided on driving around this abandoned mental hospital. It's just too cool and creepy. There's a cemetery where they mass buried many of the patients just beyond the hospital and the doctor houses. Past the cemetery, everything gets rural. You are far from the town by this point, and there's only this single lane, lone winding road. We're driving, having fun, just talking about anything and everything. It's late afternoon by this point, probably 
It's just like an old drive that we had been on so many times. That's when I looked into the rearview mirror and saw a, probably 90s, white Jeep Cherokee behind us. It had seemingly come out of nowhere. We both shrugged it off. We thought it must be a prison guard or something. It became unnerving when the longer we drove, he never turned off onto a side road. He just kept following us. I remember my aunt playing it so calm, but I knew she was fully freaking out. She kept asking, is he still following us? There were times when I didn't see him and I'd say, no, I, I don't see him. Then, in the next minute, there he was right behind us again. He got close enough at one point I could see his face, relatively. He was wearing what looked like sunglasses, very big and bulky. He was middle-aged, I'd assumed, white with a hat, and his dashboard was covered with junk. We kept driving further on this road through the middle of nowhere. There were several times we'd lose him and we would feel so relieved. At one point, we came to a railroad crossing on a hill. After we passed it, I didn't see him. We were so happy. And then, there he was. He followed us for what felt like hours. If we sped up, so did he. I still get chills at the memory of looking into the rearview mirror and seeing his face. We were also in such a rural area that we could not get a cell phone signal. Finally, we emerged onto a highway. We had no idea where we were, but just so elated to get to a main road. We turned onto it and my aunt sped off. I remember we got back to my mom's house and we were full of fear and adrenaline. We frantically said, we were out driving and this guy started following us. My aunt finally confessed how scared she really was. We never told the police or anything, and my mom always thought we were making a big deal out of nothing. But it was terrifying. To be out in the middle of nowhere, no cell phone signal, and a strange car following you for a long time. I remember we talked afterwards about it. Like, what if she had run out of gas? Her car broke down. What would he have done? Sometime in the late 2000s, my family was coming back from visiting some extended family. This was in a somewhat rural-slash-industrial Midwest state. My memory is horrible, but I remember this extremely brief encounter so vividly. My dad was driving with my grandma, mom, brother, and me in the car. I was in my late teens at the time. It was dusk and would soon be getting dark. We were on a back road because my grandma was navigating and didn't know what a highway was. There are some industrial buildings and stuff around, but it's all shut down or abandoned, and they are few and far in between. So we are cruising along, and my grandma spots a person in one of those big electric wheelchairs that, like, lays back. They are just sitting in an empty lot by the road. It was so out of place and there was nobody around and it was starting to get dark. My grandma was a saint and really wanted to stop and see if they needed help. But I had a horrible feeling and felt sick thinking about it. I voiced my concerns about how something seems very wrong. And luckily my dad agreed with me and we did not stop. It was a fraction of a second encounter. We didn't even slow down, but we tried to figure out what to do for a couple of minutes after we passed. I'm sorry if I'm a horrible person for not wanting to help, but I had that nauseous feeling that this was something bad. I don't know if it was a trap or someone who needed help or someone just hanging out for some weird reason.
stopped at a co-worker's house one night after a late shift, around 2.30 a.m., to drop off something she had forgotten. I don't know exactly where I was, but was familiar with the town and knew the highway I take home was very close. So I turned on my GPS just to get me back to the highway. Sometime after 3 a.m., the GPS bugged out and started leading me in circles before finally spitting me out on some back road in a wooded area, which I drove on for a bit until I saw a man just walking in circles next to the road. I'm a young woman with small stature and have seen enough movies to urge me to just keep driving, but kept watching him in my rear view. When I looked back to the road, I had to slam on the brakes because in front of me was an albino deer, just standing there. It looked up, then walked away, and I kept driving. I saw lights behind me, but by this point, I was looking out for more deer or weird things and ignored them as they kept getting brighter, and I thought, this guy is getting really close. So I looked up, and there was nothing behind me, no cars in sight. This happened two more times. I still didn't know where I was and was about to call my boyfriend when I made a turn and came out right in the town where I live. When I got home, my boyfriend told me he heard the sound of our front door opening and somebody coming inside twice while I was gone, but he checked the house and didn't find anybody. It was a weird night and I don't think either of us slept very well. I've been to this girl's house twice after this incident, and both times my GPS has taken me right to the highway like normal. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true trucker and road trip stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.